Yes. Good afternoon, sir. How are you? Good afternoon. You've been here all day, so I appreciate your patience, okay? Yes, sir. If you could please introduce yourself to the jury by stating your name and spell the first word for us. Uh, my name is Robert Rangel. R O B E R T, last name is R A N G E L. And Sergeant Rangel, how are you currently employed, sir? I work with the Methodist Health System or the Methodist Police Department. Okay, how long have you been with Methodist PD? About three years and maybe four months. And what are your current duties with the department? Basically, as far as supervisor, I pro reports, uh, work on schedules uh, for the Dallas campus. Um, I in charge of the, the units, the maintenance, making sure that they're equipped and running operationally. Um, answering calls for service within the hospital, outside in the parking lots. Uh, examples are dealing with patients who are altered, angered, uh, emotionally disturbed, uh, giving general directions within the hospital. Um, outside in the parking lots, we try to deter the uh, property crimes, uh, for burglaries, or stolen vehicles, uh, things of that nature. Do you know how, how many officers are currently employed with Methodist PD total? It fluctuates so much. Uh, right now I would say it's probably 35, 38. And how many officers on any given shift are on duty? Ask me one more time, please. Yeah, on any particular given shift, how many officers are on duty at on any particular shift, on okay. average? At, at, at one hospital? Yes. Uh, at, at some hospitals, there's one officer. Uh, at some, there could be as many as four or five. Let's talk about Method of Central. Uh, one, two, three. We typically run with uh, three officers there. All right, tell the jury a little bit about your background, your experience. Did you have any prior law, law enforcement experience prior to joining Methodist PD? Yes, sir. Okay, with what department? I started in 1996 with the Beeville Police Department as a patrolman. And I was there uh, just short of three years. Um, I resigned there and I relocated to Hidalgo County Sheriff's Office, which is in the southern uh, part of Texas, McAllen area. I was there about 14 years. Um, and then I took one year off law enforcement and then I ended up in B County Sheriff's Office. As far as some of the, the, the duties that I had with Bevo PD, uh, which is my first job, I was a patrolman. Uh, I moved up to become a field training officer. Um, and then I relocated the Sheriff's Office. I started as a patrol deputy and I uh, got uh, nominated to start the community policing program, which is completely new to South Texas. I was there about maybe nine months, and then I got moved to civil warrants as far as uh, subpoenas, civil process, um, dealing with uh, uh, mental uh, mental patients. Um, I promoted to investigator at the sheriff's office. I started with the juvenile investigations, property crimes, and crimes against person. Then I went to the robbery homicide division. Uh, and then I promoted to sergeant, and as sergeant, I pretty much maintained within uh, criminal investigations. Uh, some other areas, as far as I was an um, academy instructor at the sheriff's office, a firearms instructor, a juvenile instructor. I was a negotiator with, uh, we called it the we called it the SORT team, but it's the equivalent to a SWAT team, what most people refer to. Uh, I was a negotiator and, and the tactical. Um, I did uh, evidence, I was in charge of evidence, the, the management system. And uh, at, B, at B County Sheriff's Office, uh, I mainly just did uh, field training with uh, criminal investigations. Okay. So approximately when did you start with Methodist PD? What date? If I'm correct, it was July 28th of 2020. Okay. And were you on duty on October 22nd of 2022 at approximately 11 a.m.? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you recall the time of your shift that day? On that day, I went in at 10 o'clock, 
and I was scheduled to get off at 2 o'clock, 2 p.m., 10 a.m. till 2 p.m. Okay, so do you recall how many other officers were on duty at that time for that particular time frame? Yes, we had two other officers. Um, do you remember their names? Yes, sir. Uh, Katricia McCrell, the patrol officer. And we have a, uh, I, just to kind of explain it, we call them PRNs, but they're outside police department officers who work part-time with Methodist PRNs. We had Jaime Hinojosa. And so on that day, um, at approximately between 10.30 and 11 uh, a.m., do you recall receiving <coughs> a call uh, that sent you to the fourth floor of the Schenker Tower? Yes, sir. What was the nature of the call that you received? Um, it was lost property. Yeah, I believe that dispatch aired it out on the radio. Okay, so what did you do when you got the call? I responded from the ER, emergency room, I'm sorry, uh, emergency department, and uh, I went up the shingle to the shingle tower, which is the uh, tower where the postpartum is, and then I uh, walked to the fourth floor. Were you able to make contact with the individuals who uh, made the call? Yes, sir. Okay. And take us from there. What happened at that point? You made contact with the individuals inside the room, and then what happened? Um, part of our, our procedures within the, the police department is we have these body cameras. I believe back then we were, we were using WatchGuard. It's a different system than, to the one that we now currently use. So we always activate our cameras before going into the room, before we make contact with a person or persons. So I knocked on the door, um, and I, I typically, I always say police department just to kind of identify myself in case I have the wrong room or something. Um, I try to identify myself and I kind of slowly pushed the door open. I looked inside and there was a, there was a gentleman, he was wearing a Dallas Cowboy jersey, and I believe the woman was, that he was with was his wife. They were in the room, they were needing to file a police report. Okay. <clears throat> and so at some point, um, do you exit the room? Yes, sir. For what reason? Uh, there was a knock on the door. Um, usually when I walk into the room, because it's patients, I try to close the door behind me to kind of maintain that privacy for the patients. So I close the door just enough where if somebody walked by, they couldn't see into the room for the patient. Uh, there was a soft knock on the door. I turned around and it was a staff member. I don't know if she was a nurse, but I know she was a staff member because we have these hospital regulated IDs that we're required to wear within the hospital. and. She walked in pushing some sort of cart or something. So I told the, the people that I was there to talk to, I said, I'm gonna give you guys some privacy. And I started to walk out towards the door and they said, no, you don't have to walk outside. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm, I just, I always have that habit. I just like to give them the privacy right while they're doing their, whatever they're doing. So I walked outside into the hallway and I just waited there uh, in the hallway while the nurse or the staff member was inside. So Sergeant Miner, let me ask you this. This particular unit, the postpartum unit where the mothers and the babies are, is that an, an open unit where people can go in and out or is it secure? It's secure, if, if you'll allow me to explain. Yes, sir, please. Um, on the, if you're coming up the Shingo elevators, there's a, I call it a call box button. You have to push the button and I believe there's like a little camera, mini camera, and then you have to speak to the person inside the, inside the unit, means within the, the secured area. There's a nurse that tries to establish as far as what kind of business you have in there to keep people that aren't um, supposed to be there outside. So you push the call box, it turns on, uh, one of the staff members opens it, so I would say secure under those, which is typically it's always working. So in other words, somebody can't just walk in off the street. They would actually have to be buzzed in by an employee of the hospital. Yes, sir. Okay. All right, so you've indicated that you had stepped out of the room to give the patient some privacy. What happened? Did anything unusual happen at that point? Yes, sir. Um, I was waiting in the hallway, and I was looking at the door, the door where I was supposed to be uh, talking to these people where the, the staff member was inside. And I... There's, there's always, I call it foot traffic, pedestrians, the workers inside in the hallways, whether it's a nurse, a doctor, uh, a technician, or uh, any type of hospital employee. There's always foot traffic within the hallways. 
so I try to kind of like hug the hall, hug the uh, the hallway, so I, I won't be blocking the hallway. And I, as I'm facing the door, the patient door where I'm supposed to be uh, talking to these people, um, I hear what I would describe as a, a light bulb that explodes or that pops. If if if, if I'm explaining it correctly, like a light bulb that just popped. So you heard a popping sound? Yes, sir. And in your mind, again, you described it as sort of like a, a light bulb popping? Yes, sir. Okay, what are you thinking at that point? The first thing I'm thinking is, because like a day or two before, I made dinner at home for my kids, and the person who made an error was myself. I A light bulb, it was out, and I turned it, and it popped. And it shattered on top of all the food. So when I heard that noise, that's the first thing I thought, because it's it sounded identical to it. And when I hear the noise, I'm facing the door. So I turn to my right and I turn scanning that way because, because there's there's probably maybe eight more rooms to my right. And the first thing my mind told me is light bulb. And then I hear what I would describe as someone asking for help. So my mind is like, which room is that coming from? And and, I'm sorry to cut you off, but just ask you about that. You're saying that it sounded like somebody was asking for help. Could you tell whether or not the voice that you heard was a, a male or a female voice? A female. Okay. And do you recall any specific statement that was made at that time, or was it just a general cry for help? It, it was a, a soft cry for help. Okay. So what did you get in response? The next thing that I remember processing in my mind was I saw a drop, a, a drop of blood in the hallway, which at first, before I started working in the hospital, it always drew my attention because it's, it, 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 it's a, it, I've never worked in a hospital until I came to Methodist. But within the three years that I've been there, seeing droplets of blood on the floor is very, very common. Very common. So when I see the drop of blood, my mind is, pro is trying to process the noise, that voice I heard, and trying to figure out what's going on at that point. Did you see anybody else inside the hallway at that point? There was another nurse, th there was a nurse in the hallway, uh, probably <coughs> maybe five feet away from me, give or take. Okay. Do you know her name? Or did you know her name at the time? No, sir, I did not. Okay. Can you describe what she looked like? Uh, she was a white female. She had on hospital scrubs that uh, the, the nurses wear. Uh, the, she had the same color of scrubs that the nurses wear up there in that unit. And what was she doing when you saw her? She was kind of facing me, and I remember having, uh, I, carry a, I carried a little notepad to write my notes, my field notes. So I think at that point, because I'm waiting for the, the nurse to finish inside that room, I, have, I believe I have the notepad in my hand, one of my hands, so when I hear that, noise that I identified as a light bulb. I turn, I see the drop of blood, and I hear a man's voice. I definitely, I can tell it was a, man, it was a male's voice. And all within that same time, I hear a female start to scream hysterically. Can you tell what the male voice was saying? Something like, this is real. And uh, he, I, could, I could clearly tell that he was very, very angry. Okay, and how was describing the female voice for it? Did you hear any specific words <coughs> that the female voice was screaming? The female voice was screaming, what the fuck, what the fuck? And you described the male's voice as ang very angry, is that correct? Yes, sir. How would you describe the tenor of the female's voice or the tone of her voice? 
overwhelmed, hysterical, and is trying to, I guess, from from what I from from what I could hear and how she sounded, she was trying to understand what was happening. And this, so the record is saying for the juror, so basically this is asking the juror to pop, to pop it. Yes, sir. Okay. <coughs> so describe for us what you do next. You hear the popping sound, you see the nurse in the hallway, you hear the screaming from both voices. What do you do at that point? I took a couple of steps towards the door where the nurse was in that area and I believe I tried to talk to her like to watch out or to to to, to move or something like that because every, every my mind was really starting to flip out inside of me within everything that was happening and, and I tried to tell the nurse to like keep walking or something like that that your mind was starting to flip out, why did you feel that way? In order, and I'm sorry, I have to repeat it for me to try to remember it in order is, I hear the, what I describe as the light bulb. I hear the female voice like, help. I turn, I see the drop of blood. And I see the nurse standing or kind of making one or two steps towards where I thought the male and the female who had already, the female had already screamed, what the F, what the F. And the, the man, he was, I could tell he was angry. And it was right in that time that I heard another gunshot. I, I, I heard a gunshot that I said, this is a gunshot. So you heard the gunshot and then what happened? Were, were you able to see who was shooting at that point? I, I slow walked, very slowly. I couldn't see inside the room, but at that time I was like 99% sure that it was coming from the first room to my right, down the hallway. So I'm trying to look into the room without putting myself in that fatal funnel. And my mind, because the man is screaming, the woman's screaming, and then I, um, I, I try to look, I want to look at the nurse, but I don't want to keep my eyes, I don't want to take my eyes off of the door, because that's where my danger is. So I try to look over there and look at her, and, and the, th the third shot is what I remember, the nurse got hit by a bullet, and she tells me I, I'm hurt I think I've been hit and I'm just going like this because all in that same time I as I'm getting right towards the, the, the door within my uh, field of view I saw a Hispanic male he had on a blue jeans and a black muscle shirt and he had a black pistol in his hand Going back to you described that um, when you heard the additional gunshots, that's when you realized that the nurse had been hit because she said something along those lines. I've been hit, I'm hurt, correct? Yes, sir. Are you able to look at her vividly and tell that she's hurt? I I can I can say with certainty that when I managed to like glance real quick at the nurse, I saw some blood around her neck and she was holding her neck. So going back, you've kind of given us a description of this individual uh, with the gun, correct? Yes, sir. At what point do you recall actually seeing this person with the gun? It was right around the, the time that the nurse got hit with the, with the uh, bullet. And so just so we're all clear, um, you heard two additional shots, correct? After the first initial shot that you saw was a light bulb, you heard yes. two more? 
Yes, sir. Were you able to see who was firing those shots, or did you just hear them? I heard the shots. I couldn't see who was firing up until the point that I saw the Hispanic male with a pistol in his hand. That's that's who I identified as the person who was shooting. Uh, so you gave a description of this Hispanic male. Uh, can you describe what the gun looked like? Based on, on my personal experience with firearms, I have to say uh, it was a, I know it was a dark color, black color. It looked like maybe a 380. And the individual that you saw with the gun that day, um, can you identify that person? Is that person in court today? Yes, sir. If I'm in seat number one, my co-counsel is seat number two all the way down the line, please identify what seat number he's seated in. It's going to be in the fifth seat. He's wearing the uh, black uh, jacket, black tie. May the record reflect this witness has identified this case on the court. The record will show that. Thank you. Okay, so you hear the two additional shots. You see the male with the gun in his hand. What did you do at that point? I, I took a couple of steps back, and I, I drew, uh, I, I took out my, my handgun, and at that same time, uh, the nurse who had been hit, who was standing in the hallway, she's walking towards the, what I call the charge nurse desk. It's, it's kind of the main desk where the people check in and check out as far as the, uh, the nursing station. As, and as I took a couple steps back, my mind was trying to process, right? And I, I my gun, I'm, I'm right-handed, so I took my gun out with my right hand, and I put my gun in my left hand because my body was towards the wall, and I knew that if I needed to, if I needed to shoot, I'd have a better, I'd have a, a, a broader area with my left hand. But I also knew that the male, he retreated back. And so there was, there was a couple of seconds where he and I, we lost con like eye contact with each other. And uh, there's, I'm, I'm really short on words. I don't know, I'm gonna try, try to describe it as best I can. As I'm, if, I'm, if this is the hall right here, this, this table I'm walking backwards the gun the pistol is in my left hand at this time and at the point that I, I get to the next room there's like a small I call it like a little pocket you can actually get out of the hallway and you can stand right there so I, I retreated to try to take cover and once I felt, excuse me, once I felt that I could get to my radio, which I, I, I carry the microphone up here on, on this side, I radioed, I communicated to our dispatcher. And I'm sorry to cut you off, but just yes, for the, so the record is clear, when you pointed to this side, which side are you referring to on your body? Uh, I'm sorry, about that. Uh, my left side. On your left side? Yes, sir. Okay. So you keep the radio up on the shoulder area? Yes, sir. Okay, you also indicated that, um, that when you made eye contact with the defendant that he retreated back. Where did he retreat to? In, in, inside the room. Back into the room. Yes, sir. Okay. Do you recall what room number that this all occurred in? I, I, I don't know, sir. Okay, that's okay. And so you say he retreated back inside the room. You yourself retreated back and changed uh, the gun Yes, and you talked about how you began to make sure that you could call out on the radio. Tell us about that. Yes, sir. I, I, um, I, I know on the radio I probably had a stutter moment because we used to use 10 codes where I worked. And at the hospital, we don't use 10 codes. So I know in that moment that I probably use a 10 code. What is a 10 code? A, a 10 code is it's a, it's a series of, of preset numbers that police officers uh, 
use to um, what word am I looking for? to minimize radio traffic. So if I want to say a man with a gun, I'll say male 1032. That 1032 means uh, someone with a pistol or a handgun. Okay. So on this occasion, you called um, over the radio and, and what was the description that you came up with? I, 110 is my call sign or my element number. So um, I said 110 dispatch. I said there's a male, uh, 1032, up here on uh, postpartum. And um, I gave him the description, uh, Hispanic male, black muscle shirt, uh, blue jeans. At some point, once I, I felt that I could safely try to look against the wall to the room number, I gave dispatch the room number. To your knowledge, were you the only police officer um, at the scene at that time? Yes, sir. Okay. So you called out for help. Um, did you have any further contact with the defendant at that point? At that at that moment that I was communicating, I was calling dispatch to tell them to send me uh, Dallas police and to send me an, an additional Methodist police officer. I wasn't talking to the mail. I was wanting to make sure that dispatch heard me. And and usually the way that I know and they hear is they acknowledge. They'll, they'll, they'll repeat or they'll say something to acknowledge. And so I wanted to make 100% sure that they heard me. And I wanted to make sure because the radios we have within the hospital sometimes are not reliable. So I wanted to make sure they heard me and so I was focused on dispatch and it wasn't until I took some other footsteps, and, I, and I'll describe that, but um, at that moment, no, sir, no, I was not talking to the male. Okay. At some point, did the male come back and try to come back outside the room? Yes, sir, he did. Um, as, I, as I walk backward and backwards initially, and I, I try to take cover in that little pocket area that was in the, in the room down, I moved across the hallway because I didn't want to be in the same spot where he had seen me. So I moved to give myself a, 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 an advantage. I'm thinking, well, he's going to look for me here. I'm going to be over here. But it was after that I crossed the hallway that uh, the male, he came back out of the room. And when I say out of the room, he, 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 he walked Oh, like past the door and he was looking down the hallway to where he had last seen me. Did you see if he had anything in his hand at that point? Yes, sir. What did he have in his hand? He had a, the same pistol that he had in his hand the first time I had seen him. Okay, you described him as looking down the hallway to see where he last saw you? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, what did you do at that point? At that point, it, it's kind of like time that so really slowed down and probably hadn't, but at that time I had already made a decision within myself that a nurse had been shot and I only knew about one at that time. And I told myself, I'm the only, I'm the only one up here right now. I would, I would glance to see if uh, McCrell or Jaime Hinojosa had, had, had made their way up to the floor, but at that point they hadn't. So my mind is telling me if he comes out of the room empty handed, I'm going to tell him to you know keep his hands up and get up on the floor. And I told myself if he came out with a pistol, I only had one option, and that was to make sure that he didn't get out past the room with a gun. Okay, so what did you do? When, when I saw him, he, he was looking out of the room, he had the pistol, 
and I fired one time at his leg. Why did you fire at that time? Because I fired at that time because I, I feared for my life. I feared that if he came out of the room, that he was going to try to shoot more people. Okay. So how many shots did you fire? One shot. When you fired that shot, what amount you hit him with that shot? Yes, sir. I, I know I hit him. Okay, how do you know? The way he jumped back. Okay, so what did, uh, what happened? What did he do after you were able to tell that you hit him with the shot that you fired? He, he, re, he went back into the room. And there was still a lot of screaming in the room uh, from the female who was in the room. Did you hear what she was saying? I just remember that she was still screaming hysterically, hysterically. I can't recall what she said. Okay. Did, was the defendant making any statements at that time once he retreats back into the room? I'm sorry, ask me one more time. Yeah, did you hear after you shot the defendant, could you hear him making any statements until you went back inside the room? Was he talking to you or could you hear anything that he was saying at that time? He, he was, he was um, complaining about leg, uh, his leg, his leg and the female, um, I think at, at, at some point within that, that second, she kept screaming, please don't kill him, please don't kill him. Do you know who she was talking to? It appeared that she was talking to me. Okay. So what did you do at that point? At that time, I, I tried to, I was trying to find out a name for the room Officer McCrell probably at that same time, she uh, made her way to the floor. And I gave McCrell, Officer McCrell, a description. I think I repeated the description to Officer McCrell. And the room, I can't remember if I just pointed to the room or said room number, but I told McCrell that he was in that room right there. You were able to determine uh, a name for the room or who was inside the room? No, sir, I, I asked McCrell if she could try to get a name from the charge area to, cause I, I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to try to use a name to, as a negotiating tool, to try to, instead of saying, hey, you, just, but it, 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 it didn't work at that time. Okay, were you able to speak with the defendant at that time? Yes, sir. Okay. Tell us what you told him and if you got a response from him, from the defendant. Um, I, I told him that uh, he needed to uh, throw the gun out of the room. I told him, I asked him, I said, if you can let the people go, let just got to let them go, partner. You got to let them go. Let's, uh, just, let's get the people out of there. And did you get any response from the defendant? There was a response. It was still non-compliant response. Did the defendant throw the gun out of the room? In in that second, no, sir. It it took a little bit. Did the defendant come out of the room at, at that point when you ordered him to come out of the room? No, sir. Okay. Did anybody come out of the room at that point? No, sir. Okay. Um, at some point, you realized that some other officers are coming to to assist at the scene? Yes, sir. There, there was one Dallas officer, Dallas Police Department officer. I don't know his name, but he, he stacked up right across me on the hallway. And I gave him the information as well as a description, excuse me, the description. And probably within maybe 10, 15 seconds, there was a second Dallas Police Department officer. Okay. Additional officers uh, came to assist. Uh, 
Should you continue to speak with the defendant at this point and know the officers are coming? I, I try. I kept trying to uh, convince him to throw the gun out. And we, he and I spoke just briefly, a couple of words. And I, I just kept trying to tell him, hey, just come out of the room. I know at some point in time, the female who was in the room said that he couldn't walk. Okay, so what do you do at that point? At that point, I know myself, and there was another Dallas Department, Dallas Police Department officer who was, uh, we were trying to convince for someone to throw the gun out. At some point, did the gun come out of the room? Yes, sir. Do you know who threw the gun out? I do not. Okay. So after the gun is out of the room, what do you do? After the gun is out of the room, you can see it in the hallway. Myself and two or three Dallas Police Department officers, we start to walk up towards the room. And I didn't know it at the time, but the Dallas Police Department they actually had a shield with them, but I, I, I just, I didn't know that. And as we're walking, it kind of seems like they stopped for a second. When you say they, who was the person? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, the Dallas Police Department. Dallas. In, 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 yes, sir, in my mind, they stopped. And I'm, my mind is like, why are we stopping? What did you feel like needed to be done at that point? We needed to at least be able to look into that room because the gun was in the hallway and I know I had a cover unit. A cover unit means I have a secondary officer, a third officer. Um, so as it kind of seems like everything just stopped for a second, it, it, it seemed longer, but it was probably just a second or two. I take a step back and then I take a, a step forward and I try to take what I call a quick peek into the room where you just kind of like look in and you look out. Were you able to see anything inside the room when you did that? Yes, sir. What did you see? The other nurse who had been shot. You see three people speak? Yes, sir. Okay. Were you able to see anybody else inside the room besides the two? I think on my first quick peek, no, because I was so focused on on the nurse who was on the floor. Okay. At some point, were you able to take another look to see if somebody else was inside the room? Yes, sir. Okay, who did you see? I saw the defendant. He was, if, if I can give you this direction, the hospital bed is situated north and south in a direction inside the room. And he was on the south side of the bed. Uh, on, he, was, he, was on, he was on the floor. Lying on the floor? Yes, sir. Was he face up or face down from what you recall? And if you don't recall, it's okay. I don't recall. Okay. At some point, do you, uh, do you make entry into the room? I started once I saw him and saw that he was, was there. Um, with, with blood as well. But then one of the Dallas officers, they grabbed me by my collar and they were they were telling me, Sarge, Sarge, we got a shield, we got a shield. And it wasn't until that they grabbed me that they basically they staggered in front of me with the shield and uh, it was a Dallas Police Department that, first made entry into the room, like actually going past the, the door. Okay, so our officers were able to go in and take custody of the defendant? Yes, sir. Okay, and did they bring him out into the hallway? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, did you hear the defendant making any statements at that time? Yes, sir. Okay, what did you say? Um, 
who said that she cheated? Do you know who the defendant was referring to when he said that she cheated? I believe that he was referring to the female who was inside the room. <coughs> and do officers uh, give first aid to the defendant at that time? Yes, sir. Did you assist with that at all, or did you observe that? I assisted with that. Okay, what did you do to assist? They applied a tourniquet uh, to his injured leg, and I was trying to keep his head in an upright position because he was he was lying on the floor. So I wanted to try to keep his head in a in a comfortable position. Did you notice anything about um, the defendant's <coughs> demeanor or attitude when he looked? Anything unusual about any of that to you from what you observed? I'm sorry, ask me again. Yeah, did you notice anything about the way that the defendant was acting, looked, the, just the general demeanor, anything off or unusual to you about him? Just, he appeared, um, of course he was in a lot of pain, that I, because of the way he was moaning, and I was trying to ask him his name, and he, he the, the, the main thing I remember him saying is that she cheated, so I just, I, I try to keep his head um, upright as the uh, the officers put the tourniquet on his leg. Okay, so after the first aid is done, what happens next? At some point, I know that the lady was carrying a baby in, in her arms. I think she still had an IV pole or some, something. Some, she had some wires on her or something. So I asked her, I said, is the baby hurt? And she said, no. And I was like, give me the baby. And I basically um, passed the baby to another Dallas officer or, or, or someone, a nurse. I, I can't remember who it was. Okay. So at some point, um, the defendant is like, wheeled away for medical treatment. Do you have any further contact with the defendant after that point? No, sir. Okay. So what did you do after that? After they wheeled the defendant away? I took the, the the mother who was inside, the female who was inside the room. I took her down towards the charge nurse area, the, the nurse desk, and I asked her to sit down in a chair. Did you check to make sure if there was any other... Um, there were any other injuries to anyone on the floor when the shooting happened? Yes, sir. We went into several rooms checking for any other people who might have been hit with gunfire. Okay. Any other injuries that you observed? No, sir. So as far as I know, were you wearing a body-worn camera that day? Yes, sir. And was it recording at the time of this incident? Yes, sir. Mr. Foster, with the charge? You may. Can you tell me whether or not you've seen that before? Yes, sir. Okay, turn it over. And how do you know that that's that you've seen this before? That's my signature with the date that I. And have you had the opportunity to watch the full video that's contained on this DVD? Yes, sir. Does it fairly, fairly, and accurately depict the events that took place on October twenty second, two thousand twenty two, at Methodist Central Hospital? Yes, sir. Has it been altered or deleted in any way? No, sir. This time the state's going to offer State's Exhibit 17. Can I get some questions? Okay. State's Exhibit 17 is admitted for all purposes. Thank you, Ross. This time the state's going to offer as well State's Exhibit number 15, pursuant to the stipulation that the defendant is going to be for the record and floor plan of the hospital. Members of the council. Okay. Further offer state exhibit number 16, which is a crop and zoom diagram of the floor plan of the hospital, specifically related to 4-4 Schenkel in the school. 
Yes, sir, it is. And is a firearm considered a deadly weapon? Yes, sir. What kind of, uh, what kind of gun did you have that day? What gun did you use to shoot the defendant? It was a department-issued Glock 9mm. Okay, just the final few questions. Can I have the witness step down for a quick moment to show um, the jury where he's located on the diagram really quickly? <laughs> Show us where the nurse's station is. Okay, and then the public entry video that we saw, where would that be located on the diagram? Okay, and can you show the jury on the diagram where uh, the shooting took place, that particular room that we just saw in the body worn camera video? Okay, and where were you located uh, when you responded to the initial call? Where was that room located? I'm not sure the jurors on this side. I can't see. I'm sorry. Yeah, they didn't see me. Can you move it a little bit closer? Yes, sir. Okay. And 
were you able, did you actually ever see the defendant prior to the time that uh, you engaged with him and actually shot him? Can you, um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding your question. Did you ever physically lay eyes upon the defendant at any time prior to your engaging with him and, and shooting him in the leg? Yes, sir. And when exactly was the first time you saw him? It was when uh, the, the nurse was in the hallway, right about that time where she was shot, that he, I saw, I saw the defendant come out of the room uh, with a pistol in his hand. Okay, and, was, and, and did you see him before or after the, gun, the pistol discharge? Af, after, if, if, if I may, um, yes. kind of going back just so I can make sure that I'm explaining it correctly. I'm standing in the hallway. I'm waiting to go back into the room where they had dispatched me to go right. take this report. I hear what I describe as a light bulb Correct. pop. I turn between that time that I hear the, the light bulb noise, there was a second gunshot, and then there was another shot where the nurse got hit in the hallway. Right. Now, from the video, uh, from the video that we've observed, at the time that the uh, the nurse appears to have been in the hallway appears to have been shot. You were on the right side of the hallway, were you not? Correct, yes sir. And the doorway itself was in a recess on the same side of the hallway that you were on, was it not? Yes sir. Uh, so is it your testimony that the defendant came out of the room all the way into the hallway that you could have seen him from the same side of the hallway? If, if I may uh, correct, I, I when I saw the defendant I'm, I'm, he wasn't standing like in the hallway. He kind of peeked out, he, excuse me, he peeked out of the, the doorway just enough where I could see him. I, I clearly saw, saw his, what he was wearing. And then when I looked, and I looked at his hand, I said, that's when I saw the pistol. But he was still in that, what I call that pocket area. Yes. And you saying that this was occurred before or after the the, uh, the uh, discharge of the firearm that, that uh, struck the second nurse? That's, that's fine, sir. Well, the, the video will speak for itself. We'll revisit that issue. The last question I want to ask you, sir, or the last series of questions. Uh, the video shows that at the time that uh, you, as well as the other officers, uh, uh, breached into the uh, room, uh, it shows the female in that room standing on the uh, left side of the bed or what would be the closest side of the bed to the front door of the room, correct? Correct. Uh, did you observe any obstruction or anything that would have kept her from being in that location earlier before y'all came into the room? Uh, obstruction meaning did, did, was there anything that kept her from being in that particular location that she was in? Did you see, did you see any cords or anything, any IV cords, anything that was preventing her from standing there when, where she was when you uh, entered the room? Not, not, a, not like a, a blockage, if that's what you're asking me, or cords? Uh, well, basically, I just, well, I just want to to bring up the point with you that when y'all, when the door finally opened, you guys went into the room, she was standing there between the bed and the restroom in that room, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. I believe that's all I have for you right now, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Just one question, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Sergeant Whitehead, which quickly I'm just going to show you a brief portion of State Exhibit Number 17, your body worn camera, again, where for the record at 303. We see an individual here in uh, some blue scrubs. Does this appear to be the deceased individual that you saw uh, in the room later on? Yes, sir. For the record, that would be the deceased individual 